Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to all of you, our listeners. We continue to see significant growth with our podcast and can't thank you enough for your support. If you haven't already, please take a second to follow and rate Beyond the Wrench. This helps us grow our podcast in front of other listeners and feeds into the long-term success of our show. Thanks again for all the support. We really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you spreading the word for us on our behalf uh, and for all your suggestions of what we should do on the show. Uh, it's uh, It's been a lot of fun and, and look forward to continuing to grow this. For today's episode, I have with me Eric Chester. Uh, Eric, as you'll learn through this podcast, is a, a pretty amazing person. Uh, he's a best-selling author, award-winning speaker, and uh, even a, a former CTE instructor, which I think gives a lot of perspective to our audience on on uh, how we interact, how we how we engage with employees. And uh, you, you're all going to be blown away by this. I'm so excited. Uh, Eric, how are you today? Doing fantastic, Jay. I'm I, so looking forward to this. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Let's uh, let's start by learning a little bit about you. You've got a pretty fascinating background. I was able to d do some research, uh, see some of the the talks that you had given. Uh, you've talked in front of some pretty big crowds uh, and done some pretty amazing things. So, how how'd you get started in all this? Well, I'm a uh, former CTE student uh, turned advisor. I taught school for six years. I was on the business side of the equation, so I was teaching business classes, but the students were in career and tech ed. Back in the day, they called that vocational ed, so they had to have jobs, um, and I worked with the employers in town to make sure they were getting a variety of experiences, et cetera. So um, after six years at five different schools and four different districts and two different states, I just thought, you know, I got to do something different, and I, um, I saw an ad in a paper where a local proprietary trade and technical school in the Denver metro area was looking for a high school presenter. Basically, they wanted somebody to go into various high school classrooms, talk to students, get them all fired up, motivated, and then tell them a little bit about that particular college, which was about a two-minute commercial. And so I, I, I had had, you know, people like that in my classrooms, and I thought, yeah, I can do that. Well, that launched into giving, you know, three to five presentations a day, five days a week, 180 days of the year. And and pretty soon I thought, you know, I really love helping students try to figure out this next step, this how do you get from here to there where you when you don't know where there is, you have no idea. And most of us when we were in school, I mean, we know some things that we liked and some things we didn't like. But we didn't have a clue about what it is that we wanted to do once we graduated. You know, it was like, what do our parents want us to do? They want us to, you know, go to college or maybe we're supposed to join the military or just start working or what are we supposed to do? So I figured that my background in standing in front of students could be very helpful. And I launched out as an independent, quote, motivational speaker. And I hate to use motivation because it wasn't just, hey, do your best. It was trying to figure out what this word career really means. And over about a 10, 11 year period, I was invited to 1,500 different high schools and college campuses where I spoke to over 2 million kids trying to help them figure out this thing called a career. And yes, there were messages in there about self-esteem and you know making good choices and alcohol and other drugs if you had to do that to get funded you know, to be at that particular school. But so after a period of time, I, and, and during that period of time, I started getting started hearing from employers that say, you seem to understand today's youth. We don't have a clue. We're really struggling because these guys are not really, uh, you know, they're not coming into the workplace the way we did. So help us. So I wrote a book uh, back in 2000. It was called Employing Generation Y. And why was it was the generation after Generation X, which has since been called millennials. But why was spelled W-H-Y? And why do I have to work nights and weekends and wear a stupid looking uniform and smile at customers? And, hey, wait a second, I've worked here for three days. Why can't I have your job? So it, what, it spoke to the mindset of this new emerging generation that didn't blindly conform to yesterday's social mores and as I started doing that, I was listening to employers who had tactics and strategies, and I began to assemble those. Wrote another book in 2005 that was called Getting Them to Give a Damn, How to Get Your Front Line to Care About Your Bottom Line. 
And then that was followed by a book on work ethic, which was called Reviving Work Ethic, A Leader's Guide to Ending Entitlement and Restoring Pride in the Emerging Workforce, which then I started working on motivating uh, employees, especially young employees. And I studied, you know, amazing companies always being noted for being the best in their respective industry. And so I wrote a book called On Fire at Work, How Great Companies Ignite Passion in Their People Without Burning Them Out. And then more recently with unemployment, uh, you know, reaching historic lows, 3% and what have you, I knew that was an issue. So I started researching companies that seemed like they were fully staffed um, to write a book called Fully Staffed, The Definitive Guide to Finding and Keeping Great Employees in the Worst Labor Market Ever. Now, Jay, that was written prior to the pandemic, right? So it's even a harder employment situation now, but the tactics and the ideas are still very relevant. So anyway, I've always been in this school-to-work transition trying to help, you know, young people figure out the next step and helping employers figure out how to bring on and 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 hear this not just young people but this new emerging workforce which is comprised of you know gender diversity ethnic diversity age diversity bringing retirees back into the workplace and and that key you know trying to 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 help them solve that big puzzle how do i get people to do this job it's such an I think from an employer standpoint, it's perceived as being overwhelming, right? There's, it, it, there's so much that goes into this and, and I'm curious. And I think the way we, we start this off is just trying to understand why so many em- employers struggle with this. Is it just because there's not enough people in the workforce or is it, you know, I, I can't imagine 30 years ago, we were having the same conversation as we're having today about making sure an employee is happy. Uh, but I, I, I'm curious as to where you even start uh, if you're an employer. What, how, do you, how do you even start to tackle this thing? Well, I, you know, there's, there's an, an age, age old adage that goes like this. And, and you finish it, Jay, because I'm sure you've heard it before. If you do what you've always done, you will get what you've always got. Yeah, 100% true. If you're a plumber or a tree surgeon, you see pipes and trees haven't changed that much. People have. And the new rule is if you do what you've always done, you're out of business. Because we, we've been taught the golden rule, which I subscribe to, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so we try to manage, to hire, to recruit, to train, to teach, to parent young people the exact same way that we were parented, taught, employed, etc. We remember those days. And then what we do is just become, you know, uh, we, we, we think that the people that were, were parenting or employing or teaching are just miniature versions, younger versions of ourselves. And nothing could be less true, right? It's just not true. We, we're dealing with a different mentality. People who have grown up in a completely totally different world and have a different view, a different perspective of what life and career and family and what all that holds. So if we do what we've always done, we're not going to get what we've always gotten. And if we do unto them the way we would want done unto us, we might be missing the boat because what we want done unto us is not necessarily what they want done unto them. So I think the adage would be more appropriate. The platinum rule, do unto others is they would have done unto them. So why do all these problems exist? Because of tumultuous change, change brought on by technology, by the pandemic, by, uh, you know, uh, global changes, by all sorts of things that create, you know, this this new mindset in the workplace. And employers, and, and, and face it, most of the people that are probably listening to this podcast you know, own or operate some form of a, you know, uh, repair business or, um, you know, what what it is. They're in the transportation, automotive, trucking industry. And I've I've worked extensively in that industry. And most of us, hey, we were good mechanics. We were, we had the wrench. We knew what we were doing. So then we go, I know, I'll just open my own, you know, my own center, repair center, whatever that might be. And then we turn around and go, wait a second. We know how to be a great mechanic. No one ever taught us how to be a great employer, how to be a great marketer, how to be a great, you know, and all of those things apply because being in business is a whole lot different than just 
hey, I know, you know, how to how to repair a transmission or or, you know, do a diagnostics on this new car. It's more than that. And that's the struggle is that we continually have to understand that the reason that that the thing that's going to keep us in business is having good people. You know, right now, anyone listening to this, Jay, knows business is out there. I mean, oh, my God, we we can get all the customers we need if we just had the people. If we didn't have to say, look, I can get to your your uh, your car, your truck, I can get to you in three weeks, right? Or, hey, I'm going to have to hold it. Oh, oh man, if, if you could, if you had the technical staff and the know-how and you could, you know, turn vehicles around much quicker, you'd do even better business. But then here we are. Oh, we just don't have the techs. We don't have the know-how. So that's the age-old question, Jay, that we're trying to solve or we're at least trying to get a handle on. And there's no way during this podcast that we're going to provide all the answers and everyone's going to know exactly what to do. But stepping back and understanding the problem and understanding what it is that's incumbent upon us is going to help us get to where we need to be. Yeah, I think you hit on so many good points there. And some of it is just self-reflection as a leader and making sure that we're you know putting the pieces together. And I grew up in this industry. One of the things that I've always had concerns over was that it is a lot of people went through the same thing that I did, which is I, I learned the hard way. Now you're going to learn the hard way. And you had talked about catering to that next generation and that they might not accept that as a, uh, as something that they're willing to do. Right. And I think there's so much of a generational gap in, you know, growing up in business, I think that was something you always heard about. You'd always heard about the generational gap. And, you know, I had friends that were decades older than me and I never thought about it until I was in, you know, the, the leadership side. Right. And then you start to see those gaps uh, appear. And that's one of those gaps is that there's, there's some level of in our industry still trying to say, you know, I learned it the hard way. You're going to learn it the, the hard way. And I think that's a lot of our struggle is because of that. Well, it's a great recipe for turnover, right? I mean, just do that and see. And then, you know, the, the question then is, how's that working for you? And then we get frustrated. <laughs> it's not working. Or we get lucky and maybe it works with one or two. And then we think that's the formula. And it's not, you know, there's a uh, some really good movies out there that give us a perspective. You know, you talked about, let's go back 10 years or 30 years. Hey, go back 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Look how America was built. A great movie that I always tell people, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's called The Cinderella Man with Russell Crowe, where he plays this boxer. It's a true story where he plays a boxer, but it's in the times of the Depression, right? And so he's not having luck boxing, and his family is hungry. He's got to support him. So what he wants to do is go work on a loading dock. And there's scenes in there where you see him standing behind a gate with hundreds of other men banging on the gate saying, pick me, pick me. And the employer just stands back on the other side of the gate and goes, you, you, and you. The rest of you go away. And those guys are so lucky because they get to come in and work for the day. And Russell Crowe actually gets picked, but he's got, you know, it, through boxing, he's got an injury to his hand, and he's got to hide it from his employer. Not, hey, call call uh, OSHA, or I need a day off, or somebody better help me. It didn't matter. Hide it, because what you have to do, you have to perform, or you're out of there. And many of us have that kind of mentality, because even though we didn't grow up in the Depression, we heard stories from our fathers or our grandfathers, and we kind of understand it. And then we went through this cyclical, okay, so all of a sudden, you know, think about when all the political candidates talk about we're bringing jobs, we need to bring jobs, we need to bring jobs. Why? Because there's always a balance of power. There's either more people looking for jobs or more employers that need people. So it, the, the balance of power goes back and forth with the economy. And sometimes it's so grave. We talk about going into a recession. Imagine going into a depression, right? And it's very possible what will happen. What will happen is many businesses will go under. They won't be able to survive. And there'll be so many people that are that need help. Our government won't be able to just print out more money because it'll be meaningless. 
And all of a sudden, we'll be back in that scenario with people banging at the gates going, please pick me. And we might remember when we were young, came into the workplace, and we had that mentality. You know, when I got my first job, my friends would say to me, you know, I started working at, in a Chinese restaurant. Then I got a job at a grocery store. And my friends would say, hey, can you get me on? And you'd say, okay, but pretend like you don't know me. Because if the boss thinks we know each other, he'll never hire us because he's going to think we're going to play grab ass on the job. Now to what do employers say? Hey, please come to work here. Do you have any friends that you can bring with you? It's just changed. And if we understand that at the root level, really understand that, comprehend it, then we'll realize business has changed. Get rid of the old mentality of I'm going to do it my way. When I say jump, they better say how high because it doesn't work. It's out of business. Forget it. It's gone. And you got to look. We're going to have to do some things differently here. Have you heard of Runtway School Connect? Runtway School Connect is a free tool that makes it easier for schools to connect with local shops and dealerships and get the resources they need to attract students to technician programs and educate them about the industry. Schools can post requests for donations and resources from shops, and shops can post resources they have available to schools in their area. Shops and schools can visit runtway.com to contact us and learn more. Link is in the show notes. How do you... If, if you're a business that might struggle with this, maybe struggling to come to terms with the fact that the workforce has changed, how do you start to do some self-reflection and start to understand what you need to change? What are things that you need to change to maybe cater to your staff more? How do you come to terms with the fact that you might have to cater to them more? Uh, walk me through that piece a little bit. Like, what, what do you see out of good businesses that that have done the adaptation really well? Well, you go to your doctor, and your doctor says, you know, there's a there's some information on this X-ray I just saw, and it looks pretty scary. All of a sudden, there's that moment where you go, uh oh. Now, what are you going to do? You might. Uh, I will never put this cigarette in my mouth again. I, I've got to stop drinking. I will not drink anymore. I, you know, I better change my diet. I better get rid of the red meat and the fat in my diet. You're going to make a change. But without that a significant emotional event, you're just going to plot on and live life the same old way. Oh, well, I don't care if I die. If I die, at least I die with a hamburger in my hand and a big glass of beer, right? Big mug of beer. But the reality is most of us have already had that kick in the ass. Right, we've just turned around and said, "I, I'm losing business because I can't hang on to my techs, or I can't find any techs. I can't find people who want to do this job." Right, and if you're there, that is the realization, Jay. That's the point where you turn around and go, "Okay, I have a problem, and I can solve the problem. I need tools. I need help." Hence, they turn into this podcast, they start reading the right books, they start saying, but what can I do differently? If you didn't go through management school, and hey, most of the people listening here probably didn't, and even those that did, I mean, is management school what you need? If you don't have the experience, you know, learning what works and what doesn't work, and then consistently modifying that, maybe you've been in business for 15 years, and 15 years ago, this, these tactics and strategies and the way that I ran my shop, it worked. It worked. I had, okay, understand the market has changed and what you did 15 years ago ain't working anymore, right? If you do what you've always done, you're out of business. What do I need to change? Doesn't mean I need to pander to my employees. I don't have to turn around and say, okay, i uh, tell you what, from now on, I'm going to double your salary, and I'm going to let you bring your kids to work every day, and I will have a petting zoo out back for them. And by the way, I'm going to start giving 3 p.m. massages. What is what we're talking about? We're talking about looking at what we need to do in the workplace and saying there needs to be a change. Now, anyone that says, nope, I'm not changing, now is the time to to – to tune into your favorite music or a sports talk show because if you don't feel you have a problem, you're not going to listen anymore. But if you do have a problem, hang with us because we're going to talk about how in the world you can solve those problems. Yeah, and I I could not agree more. I, that's one of the things, again, you hit on so many good points there, and I, I look at it 
and so many companies are looking for immediate ROI. They're looking for they're looking for that kind of magic pill that's going to make this problem go away. And I don't, you know, this is something I'm very candid with with our clients about is that there's not that magic pill out there. In fact, I was just uh, at a chamber of commerce meeting this morning and. Uh, we talked about the local school district, and I've talked to m- numerous school districts about this, and that their population is going down. Like, it, th- th- so they're facing budget cuts because they're not th- their their actual students coming into the schools are actually decreasing, and it's because we're just not producing as many babies as we used to, right? And uh, so I think when we look at this, in you talking about how if you don't look in the mirror right now and maybe understand that you've got a problem you're going to be in tough shape here in the next few years because we're actually facing a decreasing population, which, you know, if we've already got a problem, we're just going to multiply this. If you're, if you're not looking in the mirror and trying to change. Exactly, Jay. And, and yet there there are some great bets for long-term employment hiding right there in plain sight, right? There, There are, you know, you, you can go, oh, geez, look at all the things that I'm facing now. Well, leaders, business owners have faced challenges throughout time, right? There's, there's never been a time where everything has been perfect. When we've had as many techs as we've needed, we have as many customers as we've needed, everybody is satisfied, everybody's happy, everybody stays in place. It, it's never been a situation. It's, you know, what did, they, what did uh, Jerry Maguire say uh, in, in that movie? He said, you know, it's, a, it's an up at dawn pride swallowing siege meaning every single day there are going to be challenges and those leaders the term you just used rise to the challenge they go what am i going to do today how am i going to be different than i was yesterday how am i going to stay in charge in command how am i going to increase the value of of what my service offerings are to my customers to make sure that my employees are happier and I keep the best techs here so that I can grow my business throughout this. And that's the thing. It's not just hanging on to what you have. There isn't anyone that's listening to this podcast that, that isn't sitting there going, I, I want to grow my business. I want to be better tomorrow than I was uh, you know, yesterday. I want to be bigger, more profitable, whatever. And when you have that mindset, you go, okay, Every day, we roll up our shirt sleeves and say, let's rock and roll. Now, we're for an employee, and we turn around and go, well, I just hope the place stays in business because I'm going to put Part A into Part B for the next 40 years, and I'll retire with a little gold watch in the company cafeteria. And that doesn't happen anymore. Right? (laughs) You're so right on all points. And I think as we look at this, there's so many different directions we could go at this point. But I want to kind of circle back to what you had talked about in how we take care of our employees and that it's not three o'clock massages. It's not, you know, maybe some of the stuff that the tech companies of the world have rolled out that, you know, I think at face value seem really cool, but at the end of the day, that's not probably moving the needle for a lot of people. Uh, What do we do as managers, as owners, as, you know, even fellow technicians, what, what do we do to make the lives of technicians better? Well, Let's look at the two, uh, uh, let's get, present two clear ideas here um, uh, so that at least listeners know what direction they need to go. There's, there's only there's two main ideas that I'd like to share that will help you get to this magical place called Fully Staffed, right, which is the title of my last book, Fully Staffed. Wouldn't it be great if if you knew when you put your head on your pillow tonight you're fully staffed. You've got all the people, the right people in the right places. Jim Collins used to say the right the people on the bus in the right seats. We have the right people in the right places. I am fully staffed, right? 90% of your problems would go away. You turn around and go, hallelujah, that's it, I, right? I've solved the people side of my equation. It's not just dealing with customers. It's I've got the right people in the right places. So two ideas, and I'll, I'll – I'll share them very simply. Number one, you got to be a great place to work. And number two, you got to recruit relentlessly. It means you can never stop, right? So let's look at those two uh, items, all right? Because if, if, if you're not doing both, all the everything just just comes Falls apart. Falls apart. 
Yeah. Wait, so number one, you got to be a great place to work. Well, what does that mean? Okay, we're not talking about the 3 p.m. massages and six-figure starting salaries, right? Most people go, well, there are those places out there that do that. Yes, there are, right? But you don't have to be Google. You just have to be the best place to work in your community for anyone who would potentially want to do the kinds of jobs that you're looking to hire. So if you sit back and go, okay, it's a competitive environment out there. We live in a capitalistic society where the efficient succeed, the inefficient fail. We're going to have to be efficient at what we do. And that just doesn't mean solving our customers' needs. It's solving what our employees really want. So if you stood back and said, okay, what do you think employees want? Most everyone will say, well, they just want the highest possible pay. Right. There's no doubt. Compensation is one of the fundamental elements. But what we fail to realize is that's not the holy grail for everyone. In fact, it's not enough even for the people who say that's what they want. How do we keep a tech when our competitor down the street is paying a dollar more an hour or paying more per project or whatever it is for piece rate? How do we keep that person? Well, you look and you go, there are other elements at play here. Compensation is important. And compensation just is a way, an employee's way of looking, going, am I being paid fairly for the amount of work I do? Or would my same skills get a whole lot more over there, right? If we can get in the ballpark where we go, it's fair. Now, it's great if we're fair plus, if we offer a little bit more, right? We don't have to race to the bottom. What is the lowest amount of money that I can pay these people uh, to, you know, that the government won't come in and shut me down, right? So what, what we want to look at that. Okay, compensation is one element. But there are six others, and I'll quickly go through them here for you, Jay. Six elements. This is researching thousands of employees in every kind of industry at every level. I don't care if you're a dishwasher or you're moving up into a C-level category for a major organization, whether you're in healthcare, transportation, whether you're in retail, or you're installing uh, mufflers, or it doesn't matter what you do. Seven things. Number uh, and and they're, these aren't in any particular order because we're all different and different people prioritize things different. But yes, compensation is important, right? But but compensation isn't the only thing. What about the alignment? In other words. What does your company really do? What does it stand for? What kind of organization are you? And does it match who I am? If I'm an honest, trustworthy person, I don't want to work for an organization that I see is deceiving customers or maybe pouring harmful chemicals into a river. Or I want to work for a company that is in alignment. In other words, I believe what they do. They're not just making money. They're making meaning. Maybe they do something cool for the community. Maybe they have a, a, a charity division where they turn around and go, you know what, we're going to help people who are in this situation, and maybe we'll do some pro bono work, or maybe we'll do whatever that is, right? So we want to be in alignment with the company, okay? We also want to work w uh, with an organization that that has uh, that, that communicates well with their employees, now, communication, we all want to know what our customers think. Maybe we survey them. How many times do we survey our, our employees to find out what they want? Are we listening to their ideas? So many people leave the workplace because they go, look, nobody really cares what I think, right? So if, the, if you don't care what – if I'm not being heard and I'm going, you know, this is something I want but nobody's listening to me, you're liable to check out. So communication is, is a really big deal. What about the atmosphere? The atmosphere might be the sight, sounds, taste, smells, all those things that combine. Do you know how many people leave tech positions simply because they're cold in the workplace? They don't have the right tools. It's too loud. Nobody gives them ear protection. You know, they don't care enough about the employees to create the atmosphere. And atmosphere also extends into, is there a modicum of enjoyment? I've talked to employees who work in coal mines and say, I like it here because at the end of the day, my buddies and me and even the boss joins us, we go out and have a beer or we play, you know, we, we play hoops on the weekends or we have a every once in a while we'll all go out for pizza or whatever. So there is that camaraderie in that atmosphere. And that is really important to employees. So you look at, at, at what we're doing when it comes to atmosphere. 
we have to look at acknowledgement. When I do a good job, does anybody notice? Does anybody ever say anything to me other than come to me when something is wrong? Right? It's like, oh, geez, I'm always getting complained at because I took too long on this job or the customer wasn't happy. But when I do what I'm supposed to do, well, that just goes by the wayside. So recognition is incredibly important in the workplace. So these are some of the, 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 the you know, the cultural pillars that employers in today's world really need to look at and say, are, are, are we creating that kind of atmosphere? The, you know, and, and how am I different? Here, here's a question, Jay, before we move on. Every person on this, listening to this right now, ought to ask him a question, okay? If I'm sitting here with a great potential candidate, a tech that really knows what they're doing, and I want to bring this person on, and so we're going to go through this interview, and yet I know this person is also going to interview with a competitor down the street. What can you say about your workplace that your competitor can't say? What do you do? What is different? If all you can say is, I'll pay you more than they pay, you may or may not win. But it's got to be, wait a second, here's what we do. Well, this is the kind of organization that we do. Here's how we listen to you. You know, here's how we, you know, pride what you say back to us. Here's how we acknowledge people. Here's how we, we look at those kinds of things. And all of that together creates our environment and makes us a great place to work or just an average place to work. So the fundamental question everybody needs to ask themselves is, what, why is working here better than working down the street? What specifically, and don't use generalities like, oh, we have a family environment or we have fun at work. What does that mean? You got, you, 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 you have a, uh, a, a pool table in your break room? What is it you do? And, of course, I'm being facetious. What is it that makes it, quote, fun? Specifically speak to that. We, so everything you're saying is so on point and is something that we preach as a company because the number one – first things, like, off of what you said that, I, that comes to mind is the number one thing we hear from technicians as to why they don't like the place that they're at – is because they don't they they feel like a number they don't feel like anybody's listening and and that is such a big piece to employee happiness is being able to understand where your people are at and everything you just said is so spot on and when you go to that that scenario where a that technician comes in and it's between you and another shop we say it all the time that if you went out to Indeed and looked at every single job posting that's out there, they all look the same. They all have a great family atmosphere. They all offer free uniforms. They all like blah, 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 right? They they all say the same exact thing. And when, as you're talking, I can't help but think back to so many conversations that I've had with clients of ours, which they're just general industry in talking about that and asking them what makes you unique, what makes you different. And you uh, you wouldn't be shocked, but I think a lot of people would be shocked at how few companies can answer that question and answer it with clarity and conviction and just know that they are different. And I think in a lot of ways in their head, they're, they don't think they're any different, right? They just, they, they go in and they do their business every day as they have for the last couple decades. And they don't know why they're different. They've never taken the time to like sit down and even think through that. This week's episode of Beyond the Wrench is brought to us by Zimbrick. The Zimbrick story began in 1965 when their founder, John Zimbrick, purchased a Buick franchise at the corner of Park and Regent Street in Madison, Wisconsin. John built his dealership around a philosophy he called loving care service and the rest is history. Today, the Zimbrick family of dealerships has grown to 16 new car franchises. They have 20 service locations throughout Dane County, an additional store in Milwaukee, as well as three award-winning body shops. Zimbrick is behind every errand, every road trip, every commute, every holiday visit, and every emergency. Their customers rely on them for safe and reliable vehicles to get them there, and Zimbrick is always looking for talented individuals to help them in their mission. Winner of Best of Madison and Madison's People Choice Awards for 2022, Zimbrick is proud to serve its community. Visit the Zimbrick Wrenchway page at Zimbrick, 
www.wrenchway.com to find out how you can join their team. Well, they know how they're different when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their market equation. In other words, um, why should I get my car repaired here as opposed to down the street? You can give me three reasons. You believe in your, and if you can't, you shouldn't be in business, right? Here's what we do. Here's what we offer our clients. We have a loaner car or all our people are ASE certified or, you know, you have what you, you have your, 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 your market differentiation. This is what makes you different. We charge much less than anybody else. We give free oil rotations, our tire rotations, whatever it is. We know what we do that makes us different. But when it comes to the employment equation, all we say is, well, we do with the same thing that everybody else does. Like you said, look, we offer, we also offer a competitive wage. We also have, you know, a, a health plan. Plus we also have this. Plus, but what do you do this different? And, and when you start thinking about that, you think, you know, what, what, well, you start looking at your success stories. What have you done for the people that you have that you could turn around and go, well, Ben worked for us for four years. And after four years, we paid for all his certifications. We sent him to this clinic or that clinic. You know, he was, he started out as, you know, a, as a porter. And now all of a sudden he's a, you know, a level five mechanic and he's doing this and that. And he's making so much money. He lives in this house. And, okay. Wow. That's a success story. I can see the growth, which incidentally, is one of those cultural pillars. We all want to grow. Are we growing our people? Do we have a learning agenda for them? So that we know that everybody here is learning something new every day. If people aren't learning, they're going to push the eject button. I just do the same thing every single day. But if we're constantly learning and we're training, we're teaching each other, we're having, you know, little clinics and what have you, oh, man, it just makes a huge difference. So, again, we know what our what our market differentiation is, right? What our brand says to the customer. What's our employment brand? What can we say? So imagine you do different things. You sponsor a softball team for your guys or your your people. You you offer you know uh, training that other people don't offer. You know there's a there's a, a you know a mentorship program. What is that? What is it that somebody's going to sit down and go? Oh my God. Of course I would work for you. That's question number one. What makes you different? In other words, you got to be a great place to work. But there's a second part of that equation, Jay, and I promised we'd get to that. And if you want to, we'll dive into it Let, right let's, now. Let's dive right into it because I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Well, I, I started writing a, a you know, to, to, to figure out how to solve the employment equation when there's more uh, companies and businesses looking for people, then there are people available. And that's when I wrote this book, the fully staffed book, because I wanted to find out w what does it take? Now, most everyone out there will say, well, I, I, I do recruit. I have signs on my front door and in my lobby area and stuff that says, you know, now hiring. Okay. So I'm doing that. And I also, uh, you know, post a uh, now hiring ad on Facebook or LinkedIn, or Indeed, as you mentioned, or Craigslist, or wherever you go. So I post, um, I, I I post on on job sites, and I put signs up. Well, that is phishing, and phishing says simply says I'm going to put bait on my hook, and I'm going to sit there uh, in my boat, and I'm going to see if I can catch that you know prize winning bass or walleye or trout or whatever you're fishing for, and hopefully I can pull them into my boat. And I tell people, stop fishing. And I don't really mean stop fishing, but stop thinking that fishing is enough and start hunting. Hunting is very different. Hunting isn't, I'm just going to sit here and hope that, you know, an elk crosses my path. No, hunting is, I know the behavior of that animal that I'm hunting for. I'm going to uh, learn everything I can. I'm going to put on the right camouflage. I'm going to have the right uh, gear with me, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to find them. So hunting says I need to be active in my community, right? Where do I need to be active? Well, we've already talked about schools, right? Schools. Well, how do we find people from schools? Everybody can mention the schools that are near their shop, but do you know somebody in that school? Do you know a, a career counselor? Do you know the, if they have an auto shop or a technical program? Do you know the people there? Do you know the counselors? Do you know, are you 
doing something for that school, right? First of all, can I can I be a partner with the school? Can I do something for them as opposed to just go knock on their door and go, hello, do you have anybody that wants to work here? I mean, that, that doesn't work. Go become a partner. Say, hey, if do people want to tour and learn, you know, turn our, tour our shop and learn what we do? Can I be a guest speaker? Do you need judges for a certain competition? Um, do you need some financial support? What can I do for you? Because when you do that, now all of a sudden the school goes, wow, that might be, that, that'd be a great place to, I've got the, you know, the owner, the manager's name. I can contact him because we have somebody who seems to be very interested in, in, uh, this type of career. And maybe there's a, a starting job that they could take. And then when you get into the technical colleges or what have you, same thing. So, A, we want to sink roots into schools. We want to sink roots into, what about returning military? Do you know how many people really understand how returning military works? You probably do if you've been in the military, but if you haven't, you don't. That there are people that are trained with the kind of skills that we need, or at least some of the skills that we need that are coming back into our communities, and we have no way of how do we find them. Well, we establish roots. We find the recruiting centers. We find out where people that return from the military, where do they go in our community, and how can we support them? How can we let them know this is what we do and this is what we offer, and we have special benefits or a special process for bringing on military, et cetera. And, and, and my book lists 10 different websites that you can go to to find military in your community that might look for something, you know, the, uh, the opportunities that you have. Then think about retirees. How many people might be 52, 53 years of age, retired from a government-related job, thinking they had enough, their 401K was cut, maybe they're bored, you can only play so much golf. They really have skills and they want to be back in the workplace, but they don't know how to go about getting it. You have to be able to say, look, I'm going to go after those kind of individuals, and I'm going to have a plan to find um, people like that in my community. What about people with disabilities, right? And, and I'm not, I, I'm, I'm talking about people who still have a lot they can offer, but maybe they're, maybe they've got some form of a disability, but by the same token, they could still be Great pets for long-term employment in some capacity in your organization. Think about those individuals. What about refugees? But we're taking in hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians right now. How many of those individuals might be trained to do exactly what we want? Do we know the the churches, the you know the government facilities that are bringing in them? Do we have a connection there? So that's what I'm talking about: is hunting and. Hunting on a regular basis, Jay, knowing I have got to be out there in the community working with a variety of different, what, what about uh, second chance offenders, people who, you know, were put away for a short period, and I'm not talking muggers, muggers rapists, and thieves, Yeah, I'm talking about people who made a mistake, and they were incarcerated for a period of time, and maybe they really picked up a skill while they were incarcerated, or they knew, had a great skill before, and they're looking for a second chance. Right. I mean, I have employers call me all the time saying, oh, my God, the best employee I ever had. They did a couple of years. You know, they did five at the state pen or whatever it might be. But they got out and they it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's akin to rescuing a dog that's just about ready to be exterminated. These people go, oh, my God, you gave me a chance. Thank you. And the loyalty is there. So I could go on and on and on about how we need to establish those roots, those pipelines for talent in our community and saying, we're going to not just sit here and wait for someone to jump in our boat. We're going to go out and we're going to hunt. And I'm going to teach everyone in my organization. I'm going to teach my employees how to say, what to say, how to, how to connect with somebody when they find a friend, somebody that's like them that might want to work here. I'm going to, I want my customers to know this is what I really value and this is why it's a great place to work. So if you know somebody, this would be, I'm going to teach my vendors, the people I, I buy from because they're visiting other places. They might find somebody who is looking for another opportunity, right? I want to be able to let them know, here's how you apply here and here's why you'd want to work here. So that's a lot to digest, Jay, but it, it's important. It's vital if you want to if you want to keep the best people. I just counted, and you, I think one of the major issues is 
I think there are people that want to hunt. They just don't know how to hunt. And you just listed off six ways to go hunting, right? And uh, six different sectors to maybe go after and look at. And I think what you're doing is opening people's minds as to where to work. Now, one of the things that I see in our business and just in, in our industry in general is maybe short-term hunters, right? They'll hunt when they need somebody. They'll hunt when they're desperate for somebody. But other than that, they, they just kind of sit on the sidelines and when they do become fully staffed, they get comfortable and think, Hey, you know what? This is uh this is it. Like we're, we're good. And what we see happen is I think the average stay for a millennial is like less than four years at a, uh, for an employer. And so there's going to be turnover at some point. And we, in our industry are almost in this vicious cycle of getting comfortable with our staff. You know, we'll fight like crazy to get fully staffed. Then we're there. Then we're like, okay, on to the next thing. We're, we're fully staffed. And then in six months, somebody gets in a car accident or somebody leaves and they're, you know, they're starting from scratch all over again. All of the things that you talked about were building relationships and building kind of a long-term structure to your hiring so that you don't become so desperate. And I, I, I'm curious if that's just our industry or you see that all over the place uh, where maybe people get a little you know, fat and happy when they're fully staffed and, and just stop with all of these relationships. Right. And and you're, you're very right, Jay. A lot of people go, Here, here's the first analogy. Um, you got to plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark, right? <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't raining. It wasn't like all of a sudden there's a storm. Oh, God, I got to hurry. It's like plan ahead. Uh, I, I took a trip when I was in high school with my father. We went out to San Francisco, and I saw this huge Golden Gate Bridge. And I noticed they were painting the Golden Gate Bridge. And I said, how long does it take him to do that? And my dad said to me, they've never stopped. And as I researched it, I found out he's right. They'll never stop painting the Golden Gate Bridge because once they've, they, they, they've gotten to it, the, it's time to repaint it. So it's that same process. You, you think about it. The Kansas City Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Do you think they're going to wait until draft day to go, hmm, I wonder if we should bring on somebody? Or do you think they started looking immediately the day after the Super Bowl saying, how can we be better next year? Because champions are always seeking to get better. You need that bench strength. You need to have, would you feel better if you knew you had a stack of applications on your desk of people that were talented and wanted to come to work for you? Would you feel more confident and better than you would if you go, well, I'm fully staffed now? Because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow when all of a sudden we get surprised because, you know, somebody decides to take a job somewhere else to retire. We don't know what every employee is is thinking at any given point in time and whether they'll be, you know, whisked away by another employer employer, or perhaps maybe they just want to retire. Maybe their spouse gets a significant job somewhere else. Maybe, maybe they just have a health issue or whatever. It's like you can't exist unless you know we have bench strength. I have people who want to work here. I'm all, what would they say in uh, Glenn Berry, Glenn, Glenn Ross, ABC, always be closing. How about ABR? Always be recruiting. Always. Look at the championship teams. They're constantly evaluating talent, constantly looking for great people. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to know that there are 15 more techs that want to work for you that are capable? How much less guff would you have to take from, from those that you have, right? If everyone knew, uh-oh, there are people that want my job. Again, go back and watch Cinderella Man. See those people knocking at the gate. Those guys would climb over each other and do anything, work to do whatever they could to hang on to their job. Imagine being an employer that had employees that wanted to work for you so badly, they would do anything to stay there. That's what bench strength does for you. It gives you the ability to say, I am a great place to work. So let's be facetious, totally ridiculous here, and say you pay three times more than anybody else, right? Are you going to have the best mechanics banging down your door? You bet, right? Well, okay, but I can't stay in business. All right, so that's not realistic. So if you can't pay three times as much, right, can you pay a little bit more or can you beat them when it comes to, you know, growth? We grow our people. Let me give you 10 success stories of people who started here and now they're there. We grow our people, or we communicate better than anybody else. We listen to what people say, and we reward people who come up with great ideas to improve the workplace and our customer service. 
And I have examples of companies that do that exact same thing. Or we give acknowledgement and recognition like no one else, right? When, when someone uh, does something spectacular, everybody finds out about it, they're rewarded a certain way. These are the things that make us a great place to work. Those are the elements that people begin to talk about, other technicians find out about. They come knocking at our door and saying, God, could you use me? Which is what we want. We, 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 we want to recruit, but at the same time, we want people who really want to be here. We don't want to go out and beg for people to come work for us. We want to establish those communication areas and let people know. So let's go back to the fundamental question. What makes you different? Uh, in, 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 I, I can't tell you how many presentations I've heard where people see you need to have an 11 second elevator speech that tells people who you are and what you do. 11 seconds, 30 seconds. All right, let's say you had an 11 to a 30 second uh, employment brand, uh, 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 employment brand little spiel that was repeatable. That not just you knew that every employee. What do you do? Well. Um, on your fifth anniversary, we send you and a significant other to Las Vegas for three days, right? And or or to you know spring training of your favorite team, or we give you know every year one of our employees we give to our employees we send them to the Super Bowl or what is that? And I, again, I'm I might be sounding ridiculous, but you've got to look and say here's what we do that's different, and when you have those ideas. Those, then people say, yeah, you really are different. We've got a company local to us that is um, they're pretty known worldwide. It's uh, The name of the company is Epic. Uh, they build computer software for hospitals, right? So they, they keep track of all the records. And growing up here, you know the reputation of the company. They've got – it's – you know, like a tech company, big fancy buildings with different themes in all the buildings. There's, you know, it's just a, a crazy campus. It is traditionally known as one of the more difficult places to work. They work, you know, hundred hour weeks coming out of college. They're traveling every week. That they just don't have a social life other than working there. But what you hear are the stories of they pay top of market. They pay extremely well. They because they work so hard, they actually give a two-week sabbatical when you reach your five-year anniversary because it's so hard to get to that point. But they pay for you to go anywhere in the world, you and your family to go anywhere in the world for two weeks. And so, like, when you, you hear that, like, that's an easy thing to look at as different, right? And not saying that everybody's going to do that, but they know it's a challenging job. They know they're going to work their tails off to get in there. But it's almost like a badge of honor to get to that five years to get that two week paid sabbatical, right? And I, as you're talking about this stuff, I'm like, I hadn't thought of it in that context. But when you talk to an employee that works there, and they're very smart, very educated people that work at this company, they know what they're signing up for. They know it's hard. They know that it's going to be lots of travel and it's a grind and lots of hours and people still are waiting in line to sign up to go work there, right? And it's because they're different. Right, they're different, but and, and they don't try to hide it. They don't want to, oh, we'll hire anybody, and then the day you start, they go, look, here's here's the rules. People know what they're getting when they move in, and, and basically they turn around and go, we're going to offer all these unique benefits, but if you want this, you got to be willing to do this. You know, you got to be willing to work these long hours. You got to be willing to, you know. So, in other words, people go and go, okay, I want that, right? The Marines don't tell people, hey, you know, if you feel like, you know, you kind of want to uh, get out there and learn to fire a gun and, you know, you don't mind, uh, you know, they say, we're looking for a few good men. What does that mean? It's not easy, it's hard. We're going to bust you. You're going to work harder than you've ever done before. But when you leave, you're a Marine, and no one will ever be able to take that from you, and it's a badge of honor. And that's why people say, well, I want to be a Marine, as opposed to maybe one of the other branches of service. It's that that feeling. So, in other words, you can't ask all this of your uh, per, uh, prospective uh, employees unless you're willing to say, but we pay top of market, we you know, we we give a two-week sabbatical, we do this, we have this, 
we offer this. So the better you are at being a great place to work, the more people that will want to work there and the more you can expect, right? But man, it starts with being a great place to work. And don't take it as a daunting change. I have to do everything today. No, but can you improve one element of your of your shop today? What what could you do today? Imagine you called every one of your techs in today, sat down and said, hey, we've never talked. Where, where do you see yourself in a couple of years? What would you really like to do? Is there another job here that you'd like to be trained for? You know, is there a skill that you don't quite know that you'd really love to learn? Now, imagine you just asked them, you know, like, what, you know, what is it you do in your spare time? What What is it that really, at least I'd know how to reward them, right? I, it's like they do an outstanding job, and I understand that, you know, what they like to do more than anything else is go play paintball. Hey, I'm going to have some certificates ready to send them to go play paintball or to watch a basketball game or to, you know, maybe even give them tickets to the to the concert that's coming to town or whatever it is. I want to reward them so they go, wow, my boss really knows who I am and what I like around here. What steps can you take today to make you a better place to work today than you were yesterday. If you can't answer that question and you're not willing to answer that question, then guess what? You're just a commodity and you're gonna be in this higher fire, higher fire, higher fire quit, shorthanded, can't find people. Oh my God, he called out again today. We don't have enough text. You're gonna live in that world for the for for the for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I mean just amazing perspective, amazing points and it is one of those things that I think snowballs too, right? If you're focused on becoming a great place to work and you're working at it every day and you're chipping away at it, you don't become overwhelmed because you can do little things every day that make you a better employer. And it doesn't feel so overwhelming if you just start walking, right? Start taking those steps and start making yourself a better place to work. Let me give you one little tip here. And if they take away one tip, maybe this podcast will be worth it for them. Imagine that you asked every person who works for you, and I'm not just talking about your techs. Talk about your customer service people, anybody that might be in the business side of your equation, answering phones, no matter what it is. And you came to them and you either handed them a sheet of paper and asked them to fill it out, you asked them digitally, or you just pulled them in and said, look, I'm going to ask you a question. I want everyone to answer this. It's very simple. What do you like most about working here? That's question one. Question number two, what do you like least? What's the worst thing about working here? Think about that. Get that definitively, right? And then last but not least, if you were me, and you could change just one thing to make this a better place to work, what would that be? Now, no answer is going to be right or wrong. They could say, well, everybody should have a Ferrari, right? You're going to throw out some ridiculous answers. But imagine you ask those three questions. What do you like best? What don't you like? If you could change one thing, what would that be? If you don't ASK, you will never K-N-O-W, right? How can you know unless you ask? And once you start asking your employees what they like, what's important, first of all, it's one of the pillars, it's communication. And then as Bill Marriott, I'm talking J.W. Bill Marriott with his name on all the hotels, he told me personally one time, he said, Eric, people stay in a job where they feel like they're being listened to. The people will stay in a job where they feel like they're being listened to. So if you listen to them, you don't have to do everything they ask. But if you make some changes based upon what they're telling you, right, do more of what they like, do less of what they don't like. You might find out the temperature is too cold or it's too hot in here or I hate the music you play over the loudspeaker. It's so dark and dingy or, you know, I hate the fact that you make us work, you know, uh, Saturdays or listen to what they say and try to make changes to make yourself a better place to work and listen to their ideas. That's it. This is such a refreshing, fun conversation to have. I think it's an important one for everybody to listen to. I don't know that it even just specifically pertains to shops. I mean, this is just good advice for any business that's out there. 
And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. I do want to give a shout out to our friend George Arents at the ASC Education Foundation uh, for making this happen. He had set up this this uh, this podcast interview, and uh, he told me initially in our conversation, he said, "Jay, you, you got to talk to Eric Chester. You, you've you've got to reach out to him." And uh, you know, I had not met you before this, Eric, and being able to sit down and, and talk with you, it's like. Uh, I've known you for years, right? And it's such a uh, a fun conversation. And total credit to what you're doing out there. Uh, I I think your your uh, your what you're teaching and researching and and really diving into is so important. And uh, I I just really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Well, hey, I loves me some George Aaron. Uh, the man is solid. And he's great. I will be presenting at the ASE Instructor uh, Conference this summer. I think it's in, in uh, North Carolina in, uh, in July. I can't wait. And so, uh, you know, hopefully I'll, if, if, uh, if anyone is planning on going there, make sure that you uh, come up and say hey, because I'd love to meet you. And uh, anything I can do, Jay, to further your cause. I mean, we talk about, you know, um, about the, the wrench, and it's not just beyond the wrench, it's, what happened before the wrench, and that's where we can make the difference. What happens before the wrench, before we put a, a wrench in their hand, that's going to help us get beyond the wrench. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, anybody that wants to get a hold of me, it's just ericchester.com. Books are all over Amazon or wherever, and if I can answer questions, Eric Chester, just like it sounds, and Eric is E-R-I-C-C-H-E-S-T-E-R.com. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it, Jay. Oh, thank you so much. And for all of you listening, make sure you go out there get the books, listen to, uh, you know, some examples of him speaking. If you're looking for a speaker, he, he'd be a wonderful speaker for your company as well. So uh, uh, thanks again, and, uh, and hopefully uh, have you back on again at some point uh, down the road. Can't wait. Thank you so much, Jay. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get beyond the wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks everyone for listening, and we'll be back next week. 